Hi. <laughs> All right, so I wrote about three or four versions of a speech I was going to give, and I immediately just well, I lost the first draft. The second draft I rewrote. The third one, I was like, you know what? Um, I don't really know enough about this crowd to be able to assess what you want to hear or what you want to talk about. So um, I'm going to talk for a little while, and then I'm just going to do a straight-ahead Q&A, if everybody's all right with that. Um, all right, cool. <laughs> if there's anything I cannot answer, um, I'll tell you. If there's anything I don't know how to answer, I will also tell you. So uh, <laughs> I hope that's not too disappointing because... Um, for example, I have no idea if lizard people actually exist, but I do know that they do not sign my checks. So, um, for example, that's just one example of a question that I will probably not be able to answer satisfactorily. So, my name is Brooke Vinkowski, and I am the managing editor of Snopes.com. Uh, we do debunking and fact-checking, for those of you who may not know. Um, we do a lot of journalism, um, but mostly we just tell people they're wrong on the internet, which is... <laughs> You all understand what a profound pleasure that is, right? I mean, it is so nice. And it's like when I first got this job, when they offered it to me, I was like, this is the best job I've ever had. I would do this, well, not only do, would I do this for free, I do do this for free on a regular basis. So it's just a matter of harnessing my uh, less savory personality aspects for the greater good, right? So um, there are, um, oh gosh. So... I always have trouble counting how many people we have because uh, we are very remote and far flung. I have people who write and report for us um, in just about every major city. Um, but I think at last count there were 15. <laughs> so we're all extremely tired uh, since 2016 or so. And we are, <laughs> we are all pretty much running on caffeine and chocolate and fumes. So uh, bear with us for that as well. So you guys might have heard about um, Cambridge Analytica in the last um, couple of weeks and the harms of disinformation in a democratic society. And this is kind of what I want to talk about before I open it up to Q&A. Um, so my, the whole theme of my speech is, or my talk is trust but verify, including yourself. You know, if you're going to scrutinize everybody, scrutinize your own beliefs on a regular basis because otherwise you are susceptible to disinformation. And I, I know I probably don't have to tell anybody here that, but I feel like I should say it anyway because that's sort of the baseline I, I operate from. Um, since 2016, actually before 2016, but it became extremely apparent in 2016, um, we've been seeing the corrosive power of disinformation and propaganda. Um, I, I don't like to say fake news because that is a term that's been created for the situation by the people who are putting out the disinformation. And I don't like adopting the terminology of people who are actually putting this out. I want to call it by what it actually is, which is propaganda and disinformation. And the end goal, as we now know, is to corrode these democratic norms. And so it's, it's become more than this distinct pleasure of telling people they're wrong on the internet, which I still can't adequately describe how wonderful that is. <laughs> but it's, it's now become something that if we don't want an autocratic authoritarian regime, if we want to have this sort of sense of individuality and individual power and the power of you know, a collective society, we have to take steps to overcome this extreme wave of disinformation and propaganda we are all being literally flooded with. Uh, sorry, figuratively flooded with. <laughs> it's early, okay? I'm on California time. Oh, I hope I don't do that again. Uh, so, <laughs> So we try to be sort of this first, first line of defense against it. And um, you know, we try to tell people, OK, here's something that you should probably question. You can go here. Here's what we found. But you can go here and check for yourself more. We, we don't consider ourselves the be all, end all. Because once we do that, we end up making a mistake. right? And then you make a mistake, and all of a sudden, you've lost your credibility and integrity. So we try to make it very clear to, to everybody and to ourselves that we are the first, not the last line. Um, not that we screw up very often, I hope. <laughs> I, I always like live in fear of the correction box at the bottom of the page. At 2 in the morning, sometimes I wake up going, oh, God, we screwed something up. Oh, it's just a dream. OK, cool. <laughs> um, so the, um, oh, there's so many things I want to talk about. And it's all sort of colliding in my head. I think I need more coffee. Uh, so this, this wave of disinformation propaganda um, is especially dangerous 
And the reason it's dangerous, you know, I mean, I know people have been saying, well, what's the harm? You know, what's the harm in sharing this fake story? What's the harm in, in putting this out there if it doesn't hurt anybody? It's a victimless crime. And the, the fact is, it's not, because the more you share these, these fake news stories, these propaganda stories, this disinformation, the more people don't know how to trust what the actual facts are. And this has come hand in hand with the uh, sort of erosion of, de of journalistic uh, norms as well as democratic ones. Uh, newsrooms have shrunk to a fraction of their uh, original sizes. When I first started in journalism in 19... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, 19... Actually, I think it was 97. 96 or 97. Um, when I was just a little cub reporter, you know, very excited about being out on the field and doing all this cool stuff and talking to people, uh, there were about 50, 40 or 50 people in the, the small local newsroom I worked in in San Diego. And they said, oh, you should have been here, you know, two years ago. They laid off half the staff. It's nothing now. It's like a skeleton crew. There's only 50 of us. I went back um, last year for an interview at the same radio station I'd started at. There were four people there. This is being played out all over the country, and this is what's leaving people susceptible to not knowing what the facts are, because if you cannot trust anything, you trust everything. If you cannot trust, if you, if you can trust everything, if you believe that all these conspiracy theories are real, then you believe anything. And that leaves people so open to this, this sort of autocracy that we're already seeing in formerly liberal democracies across the, country, or across the world. And People have asked themselves and asked each other how this can happen, and it, the fact is it's happening to us right now. And we need to be able to stop it, and I think the best way to stop it is to apply a healthy dose of skepticism to everything that you read. Um, make sure that you know who is trustworthy and verifiable. Make sure that you talk to and read and listen to people who offer transparent corrections, um, who offer uh, sourcing, to who, who are clear about what their stories are about when they're writing. Um, I'm talking about journalists here, I'm sorry, I should have said that. I said people. This tells you how many people I associate with who are not journalists, by the way. <laughs> it's really bad. Um, but make sure that you, are, you have already vetted people, journalists, and their stories yourself before you start to believe unquestioningly anything that you read by them. Unfortunately, I, I feel like this should not, this onus should not be on the individual newsreader or news consumer or anything like that. I feel like in, in an ordinary time it shouldn't be, but because there is nobody watching journalism, there's, there are few watchdogs, because there has been such an erosion, because there's been such an influx and such a flood of fake news and disinformation, it, the onus has to be on, on, on you, I'm sorry, the skeptics, uh, the, the people who, who question things, the people who think things through, the people who trust but verify. Uh, sorry, everybody, it's on you guys. But without that, we have no democracy. And without a democracy, uh, I mean, I, I personally would prefer to live in a country in which my voice is heard. I don't know about you guys, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So now that I've set that up, um, I'm a, uh, happy to take any questions or I can just keep talking and remember if I cannot answer I will tell you <laughs> good morning thanks Hi. for being here and thank you so much for what you do thank you Seriously. thanks for reading um, you guys I get so many hate emails per day that hearing nice things is oh, such a nice change I'm a I'm a George Soros lizard person Clinton Foundation um, hater so, uh, that's, that's a nicer one. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. So my life on Facebook is lar largely exists in kind of a liberal, progressive, mostly atheist bubble, like probably a lot of us here. L a lot of what I find myself questioning and going to your site for, and, and you know, they're pretty easy to recognize now, but it's like fake memes that, fake quotes a lot of times of conservatives. And I guess my question is, do you have a good handle on who's behind doing that and, and why they do it? I mean, I, it's um, I can't I can't really bring myself to believe that it's m malicious and mendacious progressives and liberals doing that. Uh, who's behind it and what's what's their goal? Is it strictly to make it make us more divisive? And also, could you talk about why that's harmful? Because I also get this meh. What's the yeah? What, what's the harm? Yeah, exactly. They, they probably would have said it anyway, even if they really didn't. Well, the, yeah, it, it, oh my God. 
that attitude makes me so angry on a personal and on a professional level. I'm just like, oh my god. So, um, who as to who's behind it? There are many people who directly benefit from um, degrading the discourse, and they are generally people and entities that have autocratic leanings and authoritarian leanings. Um, I don't. I hesitate to pin any one thing on any one group of people, but there is. Um, uh, it's become so controversial, but there is definitely uh, a Russian influence. There's definitely a Kremlin influence. There is definitely the, the Macedonian teenagers. There's stuff definitely, definitely coming in from inside the country. And uh, there are also, I would imagine, I'd have no proof of this, but I would imagine there are other countries that are um, still sore about us doing the same exact thing to them who have seen an opportunity and are taking it. So it's probably coming from a lot of players. Um, I mean, it is definitely coming from a lot of players, but it's probably coming from more than we actually realize. And what the harm is, I mean, it's, it's, if you don't know what or who to trust, I mean, this, th this rips at the very fabric of society. I mean, you, you go to the store and, you know, some guy, well, this, this is actually what happened to me one time. I went to the store and some guy was in there with like a fashy haircut, you know, and I was just like, you know, screw you, buddy. I mean, I didn't do that. I was just like looking him over like, oh, okay, well, I've got a neo-Nazi over here. Huh. And I, I overheard him talking to somebody, and as it turned out, I was completely wrong. <laughs> but there, there's that instant distrust, you know? I mean, there's that instant sense of, oh, well, this person, I can tell just by looking at him or her that I have, you know, nothing to say to this person. And you lose trust. I mean, it, it affects interpersonal relationships. It affects, you know, how, how you see institutions. It affects how you trust uh, people in authority that, uh, is, that are supposed to be working for the people. Um, it affects everything. So it, it really does rip at the fabric of the society that we have created for ourselves and that we know. And I think what a lot of people don't remember, and this is my, my big passion, as you can see, I'm getting real warmed up. Uh, um, if, if, you know, this is a, what we think of as a democratic government is an agreement, right? We have to agree on a certain set of facts. We have to agree that things go a certain way. Otherwise, we have no democracy. There's no conversation. And we have to remember that. Otherwise, we're just going to end up, you know, with our every, every aspect of our lives monitored even more than it is with, you know, choices taken away from us, with freedom taken away from us more. And, and I really, you know, kind of like mine. <laughs> and I assume everybody here does as well. So what the harm is, though, when you have like the, uh, the mimetic warfare is what they call it on 4chan, um, when you have that kind of like easily um, absorbed false information, um, if, if you can't, even if it seems minor, even if it seems like an honest mistake, if you start repeating that over and over as gospel, that contributes to this whole flood of disinformation and propaganda, and then you're, you're arguing over things that never even took place. So even if it's not corrosive and harmful, it's still something that is adding to the general confusion, and in this situation that we're in right now, where we're being firehosed with poor information, it's, it's just one more, you know, it's one more bucket of water to that ocean. And we really need to... Uh, I'm, I'm torturing this analogy, but we got to pull the plug <laughs> on the ocean of uh, propaganda. So, the I mean, obviously, this is not like something that is going to be a really good soundbite to somebody who's who's passing along, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln saying, "Don't believe everything you read on the internet." <laughs> and, and I'm exempting actual uh, satire from this. I mean, sat good satire is easily recognizable as such. Um, this is just the, the same kind of thing that's, that's there to deceive and mislead, mislead, and there's honest mistakes as well, but I'm leaving those out as well. Um, but this kind of deliberate disinformation just ends up corroding um, all the discourse in the country. And it does attack left and right and center. It attacks everything, um, and it's designed to do that so that there is no common ground, so that people just bicker and argue. You know, Ukraine went through this for 10 years before Russia went in and annexed Crimea, and the reason it was able to after a decade is because Ukraine was so deeply divided by disinformation. I mean, there were other reasons too, but that was a big one. And I've read all these white papers on it. This is all I do. <laughs> it's a really sad life sometimes. I'm like, ooh, it's Saturday night. I'm going to read a paper on disinformation. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, I hope that helps. <laughs> um, um, uh, a week or two ago, either in Nature or Science, there was a paper published to the effect, I didn't have time to read it closely, but the effect of, the, the, the gist of it was that disinformation uh, goes viral 
much more than real information. And th this seems to be almost a, a mathematical necessity somehow. I, don't, I didn't read it closely. But if it is indeed the case that just the way things go is that disinformation is disseminated way more effect effectively than real information, what are we going to do about that? Donate to your favorite local journalism outfit <laughs> and keep donating. Yeah. It's, it's in such a sorry state right now, journalism, that um, it's, it's just a skeleton guru all across the country, all across the world, really. I mean, journalism has been suffering a lot. And obviously, I'm biased. I'm a journalist, and I have been for my entire, oh my god, since I was 18. <laughs> my entire career has been journalism, and I now have no idea what else I would do. I've like, tried. I've tried to go into diplomacy, and then I'm like, oh my god, I'm two beers away from an international incident at any given time. Because I would just be like, oh, you know what? <laughs> you know what your problem is? So. <laughs> <laughs> so journalism, it remains. Um, but having said that, journalism is, it, you know, it's, it's this bulwark against disinformation, propaganda, authoritarianism, all this stuff. It's writing history as it happens. And because of that, it is, it's difficult. It's time consuming and it is definitely not a money maker. You have to put a lot of resources into journalism. And I think that one of the problems that's come across uh, in the last 10, 15 years is people are seeing what happens when you try to re reduce it to just a cash cow. You get these, you know, you hire people who are making probably $10 an hour. They have to write three, four stories a day, which takes a lot of time and energy and is very resource driven and resource heavy. You have to go, you know, drive places to talk to people. You have to pick up the phone. It takes time. You know, you have to pull records and so on. And um, all of this takes so much time and, and so much effort that uh, it's easier to just aggregate. So people, you know, they're on their fifth story of the day and they're just like, okay, I'm just gonna rewrite this so I don't get busted for plagiarism. And then if there's a, a mistake or bad information or disinformation, it just gets replicated and then it becomes, you know, truth, so to speak. So this is the best way that I know of to inoculate against disinformation. But what has to happen first is that we have to start regarding journalism as a public service. And we have to start we being the American public, we have to start, I guess, donating. I mean, that's, or continue donating, because uh, the, the way it's set up right now is it's just kind of executive profit driven, and um, you know, journalists make no money whatsoever. I mean, almost no money whatsoever. So I'm trying to be as accurate as I can, and I have a tendency to be bombastic, so <laughs> if I say literally instead of figuratively again, um, just boo me or something. <laughs> um, so, so it, the, it is true, like, you know, the, the saying, the, a lie gets halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. I think now the lie, like, goes around the world three times and then picks up, like, you know, a hundred other lies at the same time. And then everybody starts believing it. And then, you know, policy is being passed based on this lie. And then the truth starts to put on its shoes. Like, this is where we're at. And it's, it's fast, and the, vo the speed and the volume is what's changed, but the methods remain the same. It has to be journalism. We have to have um, moderation. Um, I think social media networks have to have some kind of moderation. Not us, like, fact-checking, but actual human moderators who are, like, looking at stories as they happen and saying, this isn't true. We need to stop this from spreading or put a, you know, sign on it like Facebook was going to do, and I don't exactly know what happened, but okay. So... The answer is not easy, the answer is not quick, but the answer is, is time and again played out to be journalism is the answer. That's, that's all I got. And I'm open to other answers, but remember, I'm very one-sided. <laughs> um, hi. Hi. Um, I was in the Peace Corps, and I think we should call you the Truth Corps. Ooh, I like it. I like it. <laughs> that sounds nice. It sounds like I make more money than I do, too. Well, well, we didn't make any money either. Oh, okay, okay, cool. And thank you for your service. And my ah, question is this. What can you tell us about your demographics of your users, especially their partisans? Are they Ooh. Democrats or Republicans? Or can you tell? Or have you not asked Facebook yet? I have not asked <laughs> Facebook yet. <laughs> I have not asked Facebook yet, but they would probably just give me their phone numbers, home addresses, <laughs> voting profiles, psychological profiles, shopping preferences. Huh, maybe I should ask. <laughs> I download, I tried to download my, um, you know how you can download a file with all of your Facebook information? I downloaded mine and it was four gigs and I tried to open it and it wouldn't open because there was not enough room on my computer, computer and I'm like, you know what? I'm good, I'm good, I don't need to know, it's cool, we're good. 
Um, I have to <laughs> figure out some other way to do it because uh, I kind of want to see what everybody knows about me because I love personality profiles and all that stuff, but um, I also have not been flooded with authoritarian or violent imagery, so I think that whatever personality profile that Cambridge Analytica was looking for, um, they kind of didn't find a lot of fertile ground for me. Instead, uh, clothing companies. They, they, they've totally got my number. Um, so the, um, oh Lord, what was I? I lost the point of all of this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, we I, as far as I know, I don't really pay attention to demographics um, of our readership. Um, judging by the hate mail that we get, uh, there are a lot of people who hate read us who are very um, right-leaning. Um, I do know that Nazis don't like us at all, which I consider a point of major pride because <laughs> it, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 2018, man, what a year, right? Like, now I have to denounce Nazis. Like, it was so self-evident five years ago that they suck, but here we are. <laughs> so, yeah, I know that um, we don't have a big Nazi readership, <laughs> or white supremacist readership, and that's because, well, there's a few reasons. First of all, screw them, but also um, I go out of my way to, to poke at them and make fun of them as much as I can because I feel as though if, if you don't do that publicly, that helps them gain power. And I know people are like, oh, ignore them and they'll go away. Well, that kind of didn't work. So I'm, I, I try to just tell them to get stuffed every chance I get. So we get a lot of hate mail from Nazis saying that we're all gonna die. And that's fun. We get hate, death threats literally, literally every single day. <laughs> that is an actual literally. Um, and so usually those death threats come from people who are saying that, you know, we are gonna, in the new world order, they're gonna line us up against the wall kind of thing. And that is, that's a pretty, like, Nazi thing to say. So uh, I know that those aren't our readers. Um, I, as far as I know from what I've read and heard and like people, the way people describe us, we are um, more embraced by the left than we are by um, the far right or even the semi-far right. The center right seems to like us, but this is all hearsay. I, I, I don't know other than going by what our uh, emails say. And I, I kind of don't want to know because I don't like tailoring news or journalism or debunking for any particular demographics. Um, I will say that, thank you. I've been very against that. I spoke out against it at like one of my jobs I got fired from, <laughs> which is kind of the reason I got fired, um, but that's a whole other story, because I thought it was so wrong to tailor news towards specific demographics, and now it's what's happening everywhere, and it's really appalling. So I guess we're just sort of skewed toward people who um, like research and don't like Bullshit. I mean, that's kind of, sorry. I've been trying not to say it, but I have a mouth like a sewer, so. <laughs> I broke through, you guys, I did it. Um, you did kind of touch on what I'm about to ask. I have a two-part question. If we have time to get to the second part, I that'd do. be great. Um, my first question is, can media outlets do a better job of policing themselves from outlet to outlet? Not necessarily NBC addressing NBC's problem, but from across the board policing each other. Um, so let, let me just start over and rephrase. Can, can media outlets do a better job of policing themselves by directly challenging positions and claims of other media outlets? And how could you mediate or moderate these challenges with real-time fact-checking and accountability of truth? Ooh, that's a that second part is an interesting question. I know uh, we don't have the resources to do real-time. We've talked about it since I started. And it's just kind of one of those things where it's like, OK, well, We've all been working like some ridiculous, lo ridiculously long day, and there's a debate going on. You know what? I'm just gonna get drunk and go to bed. Like this is just terrible. So um, that's kind of where we were at in 2016. Like, uh, yeah. and <laughs> so that was, but that was something we were talking about, like real time debunking, real time fact checking. And I really wish we could start doing that because, especially you know now, everything's multicast and simulcast and you know real time and beamed across the world. It's pretty amazing. Um, so that's that, but that's a resource thing, which goes into the first part of your question, which, um, you know, there used to be this real joy, like a competitive joy in fact checking your competitors, your direct competitors, when there were, um, you know, four or five newspapers or news outlets in um, a market, they would, they would all do that. And they would, they would have these, you know, friendly and not so friendly rivalries. And I'm, I'm old enough now to remember what, what that was like. And unfortunately, now it's, it's sort of dominated. There's usually, if you're lucky, there's one news outlet or two maybe news outlets that are you know, established and vetted and solid for any major market. And then the rest of them are just kind of on their own. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's probably going on that's not getting reported. Um, 
but yeah, it used to be that way, and I would love to see that again, but we need more resources for that. We need more people. And, and I'm specifically talking on national media level, not necessarily local, because um, I think that's, you know, local news, uh, what you get in Minnesota isn't what you get in Texas, and you know, the points of view are different, but the national news is what everybody sees. So how can those, the, what there's like four main uh, uh, news outlets on, on as, as far as I'm aware on television. Um, like does, does anybody watch TV news anymore? I know, I, 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 <laughs> please correct me, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> but I mean, just, uh, just speaking on those main, those like the, the top four or five media outlets, can they, do they have the ability to do this, to police themselves? In oh, the policing themselves thing. Um, yes, and, uh-oh, is it something I said? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not really offended. I just hope I didn't say anything that was terrible. Um, so yes and no. I mean, there's, there should be, ideally, um, there are multiple levels and layers of fact-checking that go into every story, but again, that with the dwindling of resources and the way that everything has sort of gone to corporate and executive profit. So my friends who are executives in media get really mad at me when I say this, but I'm telling you, if, <laughs> if there was some like high up executive profit sacrificed and in, in put into newsrooms, sorry, pop my pee, um, and put into newsrooms, um, that would make such a huge difference. But um, it's, it's just such a resource heavy thing to do that um, a lot of news organizations, the major ones, have done away with copy editors, with fact checkers, um, we used to have this wonderful thing, I don't know if they still have it, at CNN called the library, the li capital L library. And what you would do is you would call um, the library and say, hey, um, I'd like all the information that we have on um, Iraq in the year 1993, you know, focusing on whatever. And they would do, it was like grad school, except somebody was doing your research for you. And then they would present you with all of the list of everything you could possibly read that they had archived in the CNN library and where to look. So you could use archival footage, you could do your research and so on. That kind of thing would go, you know, that, that's... Credibility. Yes, establishing credibility. But that kind of thing is exactly what was first to go when budget cuts started to happen. That, and that's where credibility has that, gone. And that was my, I guess, undertone of everything. And, and actually the second part of the question does address that is, you know, the, the credibility is so important. But like you said, it was the first thing that goes. So uh, the second part of my question credibility is... Credibility is expensive. It, <laughs> It's also the most important thing, <laughs> you know. It's it's I like with me in rent in my house. My house is my important thing because if I don't have a house, I don't have I don't need a cable bill. I don't need a phone bill. I don't need this. I don't need that because I don't have a house to live in to use all that stuff in. So the first bill that gets paid is the most important one. I have to have a roof over my head. That credibility is the roof over the news agency's head because that's like it, it's what gives them the voice that is reliable to us to listen. And I apologize, I kind of deviated from, my, from <laughs> no, the I'm, second I'm part right of my question. Um, uh, how, do, how do we combat the idea of fake news and regain credibility within national media? And, and kind of a second deviate of that is, how has fact become debatable? Oh my God. Well, this is an the, the fact becoming debatable is, is actually, we're seeing the fruits of the disinformation seeds. Like this is what happens. We are seeing real time what happens when you lose credibility, when you lose faith in your institutions. And it is ugly. You know, you, you're seeing a really ugly time in our history. I mean, I, I'm afraid there's just no way to sugarcoat it. I, I see a you know, better future on the horizon, but right now we have to live through this nonsense. And so now we're at a point where we're, you know, arguing over freaking facts, which have been established. We're arguing over whether the earth is flat. Like, come on. We are, we are, what is going on with flat earthers? Okay, like, just, I just had to get that out there. Like, I, I mean, for God's sake. <laughs> of all things, I never thought I'd be debating in 2018. It would be. Uh, whether the earth is flat, whether Nazis are okay, um, and whether or not authoritarianism is actually better, which, come on. I mean, this is, this is where we're at. So we need to, like, we're all work together to get ourselves out of this. But the facts are not debatable. This is an illusion. You know, people are saying, oh, well, you know, that's just your opinion. No, it's established scientific fact. We have bi built our society. We've built everything we are on this sense of shared established fact. I'm going to start frothing at the mouth in a second. <laughs> I get so mad about this. You cannot 
look at thousands of years of observation and history and scientific method methodology and scientific studies and say, you know what, actually, I think that we can like agree to disagree on this one. Don't agree to disagree. Just say, you know what, you are wrong. I, I'd like to, I, I would like to, and I, I agree, absolutely. I, I'd like to propose that, that, I apologize. <laughs> sorry about that, but yes, I will go on and on forever too. I'm just like, ah, okay, sorry. Um, uh, if you have officially published something about this on Snopes, you can just direct me there, but in your professional opinion, which national media outlets are the most upstanding and trustworthy? Hmm. I um, have a subscription to Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, I read CNN, I read Al Jazeera, I read Fox, I read MSNBC, I mean, I read, oh, New York Times, LA Times, I read as much as I can, actually my Twitter feed is basically like comedians and journalists. Like the comedians are necessary because otherwise I'm just get, I get really depressed and there's a comedian going, ah, hot take, I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. So after about 10.30, my Twitter gets a little bit weird and it's fantastic. It offers right, the right note of absurdity. But um, the point of all this is uh, I, I read as many big city outlets as I can and then I try to read the smaller outlets as well because there's so much that's going by the wayside right now that deserves to be national. And um, so the, the thing is I don't, I don't ever hew to just one news outlet. Um, because every news organization has their biases. Every news organization has a slant. It's the ones that are transparent about it, the ones that they, they have a beat or a coverage area. That is a bias or a, a slant. I mean, you have to leave things out. So you have, you know, your bias towards a certain region or your bias towards a certain mentality. Um, so I guess for Washington, I read um, Washington News, I read Washington Post. Um, I also will read, you know, well, like I said, Wall Street Journal, I'll read The Economist, I'll read, oh God, it's exhausting actually. Um, but th the established ones, the ones that have a track record of uh, correcting their mistakes and having clarifications and open updates um, that you can you clearly see when you go look at the story, those are the ones that I read. So um, I also, I, I know a lot of the reporters at CNN because I work there and I have a good relationship with them, which I never expected to say because I left so bitterly 15 years ago. Um, but I have a, a good working relationship and um, I trust those journalists. They're, they've gotten really good at it, which I also would not have said about 10 years ago. Um, so they've, they're quite good and it's, I mean the established brands are established for a reason. They may fall down on the job, but at least they will correct themselves. There is no good answer. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, what is the, the best example you can think of of a case where Snopes has accidentally gotten something wrong? Oh my God, I screwed something, oh, spitting all over the place. I screwed something up really badly a couple of years ago and I still, like, it still recurs to me sometimes. This is, oh God. So um, my degree um, is sort of, it's one of those multidisciplinary degrees, but part of it is in linguistics. And so we had questions coming in about where the word guacamole came from. And I decided that I didn't need to talk to any experts because I'm a linguist. So I wrote this whole page about how it means testicle sauce. And, <laughs> which it sort of does, but as it turns out, I didn't know enough about this specific language, which is um, Nahua, Nahuatl, um, which is, you know, one of those incredibly complicated languages that uh, a neophyte like me should never have been addressing to begin with. So I wrote this whole thing about, yeah, it means testicle sauce. And then all these linguists started writing me and they're like, why didn't you reach out? I'm like, I did. Linguists need to answer their emails which is true, I did. But um, <laughs> they were like, it's, it's, yes, it means testicle sauce, but it's sort of a back formation and it's slang and the actual like terminology is this and that. And so, you know, avocado, the avocado <laughs> is, <laughs> the Nahua like slang term for it is testicle because it kind of looks like one. And then, you know, the, the word uh, moli or moli uh, means uh, ground or sauce. So it kind of does, but it, it was not accurate because I didn't note that it was slang and all these charts that I put in there were just bullshit. I totally <laughs> screwed it up. I, I had linguists writing blogs about this. It was awful. So I had to do this whole update and oh my God, you can find it. I still, so now it's correct. Now I've, I've dealt like I've dealt with everybody. I've written my apologies, you know, and everything. And it, that was in 2015 and I still sometime, some nights will wake up like, <gasps> <laughs> so that's
that's mine. That's my big screw up. And mea culpa, everybody, if you read that. I'm so red right now. <laughs> Uh, who is next? I'm sorry. Let's, yep, this one should be really quick. Okay. Um, you mentioned that your Twitter feed is mostly comedians and journalists, <laughs> and you were talking about preferred outlets and stuff. Do you actually recommend trying, like, finding individual journalists? Oh yeah, more Absolutely. even more than outlets. Um, he, well, I think so because um, journalists can't resist putting their scoops up immediately. But that's only if you want, like, you know to get everything up to the minute. But I also like hearing them discuss, you know, I, I like seeing journalists have conversations with each other and seeing, um, you know, what they have to say. I, I like their hot takes. I, I like hot takes. Um, I like seeing what they have to say and what they think about it. And um, you don't generally get that with a lot of traditional news outlets. One of the things that I'm seeing, th which I really applaud, is that journalism as a model, even though it's in dire straits right now, it's changing. It's becoming less of a, you know, sort of, I'm gonna explain to you why this is happening and more of a, let's discuss why this is happening. It's becoming, you know, if, if journalism survives and if, if the country survives, um, I think that we're gonna see a lot more um, two-way, like interactive journalism where people, like, people are updating things live and it's, it's gonna be less, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's gonna be more inclusive, basically. I'm hoping, I'm trying to do my part. Anyway, I've got like three minutes left, so. So you've talked a little bit about credibility and keeping things unbiased. Um, do you ever find you have to avoid some hard topics? For example, I did a search, does God exist? And I didn't see the article, no, on Snopes.com. Wait, 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 the what? Uh, do you ever find that you have to avoid certain topics on Snopes in order to keep credibility or be unbiased? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, wait, can you give me one, that example one more time? So I did the search before I got up here, does God exist? And oh. There wasn't an article that said no. Well, the problem is you can't find proof that God doesn't exist either. You know, it's this ineff ineffability, or at least not enough proof that will satisfy people who truly believe that God exists. So we, I guess we could put it up as an unproven, but the only reason that we don't have it up is because it's too all-encompassing of a page. I mean, I think we would just go on forever about the different ways God does not exist. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And then we get emails going, well, actually, you're wrong because this and this and this. Um, but we, I, I can't say that there's any such thing as unbiased journalism. I, I kind of want to get that across and make it clear because every, you, you always have to have some kind of bias. What you have to do is look for people or journalistic outfits that are open about their bias and open about, you know, their area of coverage. So my personal bias is that I do not like authority <laughs> and I do not like white supremacists. And I will be totally open about that. So I'm very anti-authoritarian. So everything I say, please view it through that lens, you know, and I try to make sure that people know that. And I really despise lies, right? I despise misinformation. And that's kind of our bias. So when people tell us we have a right wing or a left wing bias, we get both, by the way, or that we're being run by the lizard people or George Soros or Hillary Clinton or whatever. Um, I try to, you know, <laughs> I try to remind everybody that no, our bias is just that we don't like bullshit. So uh, that's sorry, that's a side note. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So uh, someone's going to get mad at me for asking. This is the last question, I'm sure. But um, so uh, big database micro targeting, um, which is you know a lot of what Cambridge Anal Analytica did, uh, is in the news now, and uh, people are just now right. discovering how this works. I've um, been pushing this for like two years, but yes. It is also a part of my job. Um, I, I literally do this for a living. And I had um, someone approach me as a potential client who wanted me to assist them with a disinformation campaign against their opponent. And I said no. And then I went and warned the Democratic Party. Thank you for your service. Okay. Um, but this brings up a really interesting question on the nexus of, of um, ethics and free speech here. Um, because micro-targeting obviously has some very useful benefits when it comes to you know, marketing clothing to people, as, as you said, or reaching voters on things that they care about. This um, is micro-targeted right to me, and it works. So I'm wondering, I'm uh, interested in your opinion on how we address that, whether it's from a regulatory perspective. How do we go about ensuring that we're maximizing the, the ability for candidates to be able to reach their voters how they see fit, but ensuring that it's done in an ethical fashion? I think that... Um, 
we should never underestimate the power of flooding out disinformation with vetted news. I mean, the reason we don't see it right now is because it hasn't happened in so long. We have actually been struggling with creeping disinformation for a long time, much longer than you know, 2016, although 2016 is, of course, when it really ramped up. There are ethical ways to use big data and surveys to, to target people. Um, part of that ethical, uh, or ethicality, part of that ethicality would be um, to let them know they're being targeted. You know, I mean, let people know they're using, you're using their data and let them opt out of it. Let them know what you're using it for. I mean, I don't care if, uh, you know, Uniqlo wants to market clothes to me. I mean, please, uh, please do. I wanna know like what outfits I like. <laughs> but when it comes to, if you're testing me for, for authoritarian leanings and then flooding me with, with images of, of scary people who are coming for my guns and you know, I don't realize that nobody else is seeing this and I'm just seeing all these images every time I log into Facebook and nobody's disclosing this, nobody's disclosing why and I'm going around in this sort of state of heightened psychological arousal all the time and I'm pissed off and I just wanna buy more guns because you know, they're coming for them, whoever they is, are. Um, then th there is an ethical, you, you have to let people opt out of that. You know, I mean, this is why we're in this mess right now because people are, they have been operating off a completely different framework without disclosure for the last at least two years. Um, so there are ways to do it ethically. I mean, th I really strongly believe that there needs to be independent regulatory bodies, at least oversight committees, so that people have a chance to say, no, I don't like this or you know, they have a chance to listen to other people saying, no, I don't like this, this is wrong, we should not be doing this, because right now, the, the social media uh, scandal that we're going through is in part because everything is being handled by a small and relatively insular group of people who uh, think that, you know, for example, algorithms can solve this problem, which it absolutely, absolutely cannot. You have to have human moderation. So yeah, I believe in independent outside regulation, and I believe in transparency, and I think that that's the only way in conjunction with, with, with journalism and bringing journalism back that we're gonna get out of this intact as a country. When I say it out loud like that, it's really scary. <laughs> uh, I think that I'm out of time. Okay, I'm out of time. Um, if there are any other questions, please let me know. And thank you so much for listening.